Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. It's where we're going to be spending time today. And I want to uh, give credit to my wife for bringing to my attention Psalm 27, which was our call to worship today. And I'm hoping that you will see a combination of the two being helpful to you today. Inside your bulletin book, which by the way is still experimental, if you note uh, the artwork on the front is Peter's art, and uh, we took that off of the card, and we deliberately placed the worship information on the back of the bulletin, because as you know, Peter wanted us to concentrate on worship while we were in worship. And so I'm going to deviate from that just for a moment and say that you will find a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper inside your bulletin. And this is how you can show the nominating committee how you would like to worship God in service. So it's only a slight deviation from Peter's idea that we should be concentrating on the Word and that we should be concentrating on God as we worship together at this moment. But this is how you can let me know, let the nominating committee know, this is an area that I feel God is calling me to be a part of and to do service for Him through the services of this community of faith known as the Santa Clarita Church. We are pulling together the nominating committee. We are going to be doing our work here in August. And we are also then going into September with our recommendations. And just know that this church has chosen a two-year commitment. And so I haven't talked to you about this for most of the time that I have been pastor at this church. It's over two and a half years now, and we've done nominating committee only once. This is the moment... For you to say, Lord, what will you have me do? Where can I serve the community through the church? I know that many of you serve the community through other ways, and I'm blessing you for that. I'm saying, God bless you. That's wonderful, and I believe that God will reward you for what you do. However... As a community of faith, we have things that need done, and we ask that you look at that very, very seriously. Matthew chapter 16 is one of my favorites. And you say, oh, pastor, they're all your favorites. Yes, yes, I, I have quite a few favorites. But this, this, one, this one is a favorite because it has with it the idea of the church. And it has with it the, the fact that Jesus is in the midst of his ministry and he is needing the church to understand why he came. Last week, uh, we talked about God's intentions towards us. So I thought it only fitting that we follow that up with our intentions towards God. You know, in, a, in any good relationship, uh, especially uh, as a father, and I, I mentioned this last week, and, and I know that you fathers who, who have marriageable age children, uh, either having had experienced this or are going to experience this, Shout out to my friend Denny Grady, whose pictures on Facebook uh, showed that he just had the opportunity to do what I did, which was to give my daughter's hand in marriage, and then preach the sermon, and then ask for the vows. It's, it's an incredible thing that you get to do, and uh, just want parents, just want you to know that you only need a license to do the vows. If you have an idea about uh, uh, doing the homily at your child's wedding, go for it. Doesn't have to be a preacher. 
Let me tell you, there's some wonderful things that can be said at those moments that make for a lifetime of memories. But it's an incredible thing when you have these two people standing before you and, and they are saying what they intend to do. And so last week we heard about God's intentions for us. And, and, and you know, as I was, was thinking, I, I thought, you know, we... We better check, we better check to make sure that our intentions towards God show that we know who He is. We, we have a concept of God, but maybe today for a moment, I, I, I hope you don't take this as an insult, Okay, maybe you, you've said, I, I know who God is, right? But I'm, I'm thinking that this particular piece of Scripture that Matthew includes here, this interaction between himself and the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, many times we want to say how, you know, what bad people they were. No, no. These were well-intentioned People. They were kind of different tribes, different factions in the, in the church of Jesus' day. And, and, and let me tell you, they still exist. Those kinds of tribes, those kinds of thinking groups, if you like, still exist in our church today. My wife was talking to a friend this week, and, 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 and the friend was telling her about uh, a, a, an, an uncle of hers who has become enamored with uh, a particular big-time speaker in the Adventist church, and, and this speaker is, is saying all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And um, it, 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 I'm just going to tell you, it, it was a struggle at that moment because I'm not a part of his Adventist tribe, it was a struggle for me to respond through Chris in a text that said something nice. You know, remember what mom taught you? If you can't say something nice, what? Okay. Don't say, okay, so I didn't say something bad. I, I said, Make sure you take a grain of a big grain of salt when 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 you listen. I, and I certainly hope that that you don't take what I say without checking me. I, I really honestly say that. I, I would love to confer upon you the blessing that Paul conferred upon the Bereans who went to their Bibles after the preacher had preached and came back the next morning and said, okay, preacher, we now believe what you said because it matches up with Scripture. And, and Paul said, that's a good thing. So I'm saying, that's a good thing. Don't, don't take what I say about Scripture to be exactly... Check it out for yourself under the guidance of the Holy Spirit because I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will inspire all of us as we study together, and so it was for Jesus when he is confronted by the religious elite, these, these tribes within Judaism in his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is verse 1 of Matthew 16. They came to see Jesus and tested him. Okay, They felt it was their right and their duty to test these young people rabbis, these young upstarts that were coming around. And as I've said before, please understand that uh, historians like Josephus tell us that Jesus was not the only person to be claiming to be a Messiah, even at the time of Jesus. Okay, so uh, th this, this was a time in which people wanted to see a revolution take place and Jesus was looked at, this is a clue to what we're talking about today, Jesus was looked at as one that would potentially be able to fulfill the intentions of the people. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. 
Now, if there is ever a people, if there is ever a denomination, by the way, many people talk about religion, and I want you to know that religion is the big thing. So different religions could be Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism. So please don't confuse the word religion with denomination, meaning the name of. We are a denomination of Christianity, are we not? Okay, so make sure that you keep those two things straight. Religion is a whole way of thinking about God, and denomination might be one particular group within that religion. And they were wanting to see a sign. They were wanting to see a sign. And he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, folks, we live in a day and age where uh, the country has the flags at half-mast. If you go past Bouquet and Valencia on the corner there, you will see that McDonald's has their flags at half-mast because of the Americans that were gunned down in the last week and a half. Signs, signs of the times, signs of the times. He says, you know how to interpret the weather, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. He turns to his, his, uh, his own disciples and he says, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Uh, be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. My friends, Jesus, I'm just going to be plain with you. Jesus is talking about their philosophy. He's talking about their uh, uh, sarcastic attitude. He's talking about their willingness to, to test God when God appears. And he's talking about, he's just talking about an, a, a general attitude that they have towards his ministry. And he's saying to his disciples, be careful. Be careful if you have that kind of attitude because it reveals your intentions. It reveals your intentions. The religious elite, the custodians of the rules and regulations, they had their own interpretations of what they thought God was. And it's, it's something that has caught me, and, and, and uh, unusually I grabbed a hold of this early in the week, and, and these things, these things uh, just poured out of me. So if, uh, again, excuse me if, if I'm passionate about this, because I'm, I'm interested in not being like this. Here we go with a, a piece of scripture and, and some people who are the religious elite of their day, and I'm basically saying to you, I, I really hope that I'm not like this. And maybe by the end of this moment together, you will also have that same hope. Aware of their discussion, Jesus says to them, this is verse 8, you of little faith, why are, why are you talking amongst yourselves having, about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Do you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? By the way, uh, do you know that that was the point of why Jesus fed the 5,000? For all the basket loads that each one of the disciples picked up afterwards. By the way, Test question, how many baskets were there after the 5,000? 12, which was what? One for each. Okay, so are, are, you, are you catching this? Jesus, Jesus fed 5,000 people to make a point for his disciples. Don't miss that. If you feel you're a disciple of Jesus, he's talking to you today. And how many baskets were gathered when the, uh, the seven loaves were done for the 4,000 and how many you gathered, how, how it is, verse 11, how it is you don't understand that I was not talking 
to you about bread. Be on your God against the yeast of the Pharisees. Be on, look carefully at their motives. Look carefully at what they are constructing as their idea of God, as their intentions towards God. Be careful. They wanted a sign. And Jesus calls them wicked and adulterous. Um, you don't have to go far. You just have to read the book of Hosea to know that God used the life of one of his prophets as a modern allegory to talk to his people about how he felt about their relationship with him, how he felt about their intentions towards him. Because you see, in that story, Hosea plays the part of God, and Gomer, his bride, plays the part of the Israelite people. And she is this woman who goes backwards and forwards, in and out of that relationship with him, and in fact bears him three children, none of whom are fathered by him. And so God, God checks his people at various moments. And here again, God incarnate, Jesus Christ, the, the God-man who has come and is with his people, is trying desperately to help even his closest friends, even his disciples, to catch a glimpse of exactly who he is and what his intentions are, and then to check their intentions towards him to check their picture of who he is so that they will properly appreciate who God is and what his intentions are towards them. But he calls them a wicked and adulterous generation because they are looking for signs. Now, just to make sure that you, you, you understand that, um, I, I did, did some digging and there were, there were three signs that uh, were needed in order for someone to qualify as the Messiah. Um, uh, one of them was that you were to heal a leper. Okay, You were to heal a leper, and that one happened, uh, recorded in Matthew chapter 8. So if you're taking some notes, just understand, you can look up Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 to 4. And the second one was that you were to cure a, a, a dumb person, and this is dumb as in cannot speak, because they are possessed of a demon. That one happened in Matthew 12, uh, verses 22 to 37. And, and, and in other places, it's also recorded in the Gospels. Then the third one was that you were to heal a man born blind. This is actually one of my favorites. Uh, Jesus heals this man, and his disciples ask him, remember what the question was? Did he sin? Or did his parents? In other words, that he was born blind was evidence of a curse, was evidence of the displeasure of God. The reason that this is so fascinating to me is it reveals a picture of God that the people had, a picture of the Messiah that the people had in Jesus' day. In some respects, you could say, this is what Jesus was up against when he came to his own. And the Bible says he came to his own and his, I'm going to reinterpret it for you. He came to his own and his own did not even begin to understand who he really was. Their picture of him was messed up in, 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 a, in a phrase. It was, it was messed up. Jesus had to deal with that, and he, he does so in, in masterful ways. But he says to them, you're a wicked and adulterous generation because I have already done all three of, of, of the signs 
that are supposed to, to be the signs that would authenticate the Messiah. And you're still asking for more. You're still, you're still asking for, to, for, for, for more. Uh, dumb. <laughs> it, it's a nice word. Uh, your, your parents probably taught you not to use it, not to call anybody dumb, right? But it's really hard at this point. From our vantage point, we're seeing this and we're saying, this is, this is God talking to you and, and you're asking him for another sign when he's already given you everything. Verse 14 after Jesus asks a very important question now to his inner circle, to his, his group of disciples, people who are, uh, are walking with him and talking with him and sleeping out in the open and eating and, and, and watching him do these miracles, who had seen him do these miracles, he asks them the important question that is being asked to us today. Who, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? Collectively, we could say, what, what are our intentions? What is, what is our picture of God? He gets a variety of answers, all of which have to do with reincarnation. Oh, you must be John the Baptist. <laughs> Come back to life. Your, your cousin that got beheaded, that's who people say you are. Uh, you must be Elijah. Now, Adventist people, uh, those of you who do love prophecy and study prophecy, uh, we, we do. We say we, we have the Elijah message. Some say he's Jeremiah. Anyone read the book of Jeremiah lately? Lord knows it's an example of why I would not want to be a prophet. Amazing. Peter says in verse 16, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of the living God. Jesus turns to him and says, blessed are you, Simon, Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man. In other words, Peter, this is not an original thought with you. This is not even a thought that you got from the, the scribes and the Pharisees. This is not something that you have heard from one of the other disciples. This is something that the God of heaven, my Father, has revealed to you. Just the way that he says it. Jesus hears his Father's voice. Can you imagine, can you imagine, uh, the, the turmoil in Jesus' mind at that moment. He is so happy to hear his father's voice coming through Peter, but at the same time, he is saying, Peter, Peter, my dear friend, uh, this was not an original thought with you. This was not your intentions, your idea of who I am. This is the father speaking through you because it's not who you really think that I am. Verse 18 begins my, my happy place in this text. I just want you to know. Upon this rock I will build my church, says Jesus, and the gates of Hades will not come against it, will not overcome it. And, and so in this moment, Jesus, Jesus kind of shifts around and puts back on Peter the idea of what he knows the church to be and who he knows himself to be. So as we are reviewing this morning our intentions towards God, our idea of who he is, hear Jesus when he says, I am the rock. Please understand that Peter's name meant rock meant little rock no he wasn't from arkansas but he is this rock and jesus puns he puns off of this and says i am the 
cornerstone. Did you sing that this morning? I hope that filtered into your imagination. He is, he is the cornerstone upon which the building is, is squared. It is, the, it is the way in which the builders would build. They would start with the corner, they would set the cornerstone, and then the walls would go out from that cornerstone, would go up and out from that cornerstone. That is how they built with rock in those days. And Jesus says, upon this rock, upon myself, I'm going to build this church upon myself. But church Look what he says. He says, when this church that is built on me, that is, that is thinking correctly, that has the right intentions towards God, and God knows that they have the right intentions, he is going to say these words. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Which kingdom? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And people want to say, oh my goodness, pastor's gone to teaching Catholicism and the idea couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus is talking about the fact that when the church understands and has a proper picture of who God is, then what they conceive of God, what they believe God is doing and will do, is exactly what he is doing and will do. Things are as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. Or as it is on earth, so it is in heaven. This, this is a description in my mind of the way in which the kingdom of this world can be identified right now right here, on earth. Not to say that it's not coming in reality and Jesus is not going to come and that we should think, oh, the kingdom of God is here. Uh, what, What else is there? No, there is. The coming of Jesus is going to bring about the big change. Don't, Don't lose sight of that, but please understand that Jesus is telling us here the kingdom of God is here on earth. He proclaims that and he says, when you understand that, you enter into a proper relationship with me. And when you do, that church, that church that understands who God is and understands about his power and understands that Jesus is the king of the world now and understands that his kingdom is now in place on this earth even though there is an evil empire that is lashing out and trying to take back people and is imprisoning them in lives that are hell on earth. The second part of verse 16 says, please read it with me because it is so amazing. Verse 18, sorry. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It is reflexive back to the church. This this group, this called out group of people who, who understand God and understand that his kingdom is in the here and now is going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, I believe, even now with the ability to reach into the hell that, there are, that, that people are living in, in the here and now. Every day, every day you pass by people. Chris and I, when we see them, we, we just say, you know what? The crazies got them. The crazies got them. They, my friends, are your and my fellow human beings that are in the clutches of the evil empire. And this text, this text tells us that when we have 
an understanding of who Jesus is, have a, 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 a proper understanding of who he is and what he has done and what he has called us to, we will be on mission. So yes, I, I held up this little piece of paper and it, you know, it has a, a bunch of little things on it like uh, deacon, deaconess, uh, work with children's ministries and health ministries. Come on, people. This is, most of this stuff has to do with taking care of ourselves. That's why I said I know that there are many of you who have ministries that are born of God that, 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 that have been called to minister to your fellow human beings in ways that you never tell us about but that God knows. And I say, Praise God. Keep going. Don't, don't stop. The gates of hell will not be able to keep the church out of hell. And you're thinking, well, I thought hell was in the future. Like, you know, that hot burn... I don't know which theology you grew up with, but that idea of the everlasting burning hell, that's a fabrication. Came along several hundred years ago. It's very popular with many Christians today as a way of leveraging people into worshiping God. But the longer you think about it, the more you come to the conclusion that if there is an everlasting burning hell, I'm not sure I want to believe in that God. And there are a lot of (laughs) these people that call themselves nuns, as in N-O-N-E-S. I'm not any religion. I'm a nun. None of these. It's because of this doctrine of everlasting burning hell that they don't want anything to do with Christianity or the God of Christianity. And I say, amen to that. Because that picture of God is something that should die. And he says, will die, read Revelation, will die in the lake of fire. Death and Hades are thrown as, as ideas, as, you know, places, destinations. Situations. All of that is done. God says, I'm going to make an end of that system. But the church is going to help me. The church, us, we who understand this great God who has come to save humanity is going to use us to go into the lives of the people who are in the clutches of hell. And, and we're going to do for them what God would want us to do, what Jesus would do if he were here. So he tells them, the only sign you're going to get from me is the sign of Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for how many nights? Three days, three nights. Then the whale earths him up. And he goes and does his job. This was the three three day prophecy about the Son of Man, that he too would be gone. And on the third day, he would be given up out of the depths, and he would go on to do his saving ministry. And he is today, my friends. That is what he is doing today. You see, uh, today we're asking ourselves, what are our intentions towards Jesus? You see, the disciples, the disciples, back to them for a moment, wanted him to rule Israel on David's throne. I can't help but give you this small parenthesis. Do you remember how many languages the Romans wrote Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, on his plaque, how many languages? Three, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. 
They wanted everybody, everybody to know that this guy who just a few days ago had been lauded with palm branches and with people stripping off their robes and putting them in front of the donkey that he was riding on saying, blessed Hosanna to the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. What picture did they have of him? He was coming to overthrow the Romans. And now just literally a few days later, he is on a cross. And that is the Roman answer, my friends. That is the Roman answer in this milieu that Josephus tells us about where there is Christ after Christ after Christ. They put this one up and they desecrated him by putting him between two thieves To say, you think you can steal any homage from Caesar? Think again. If you think you're the king of the Jews, this is what we're going to do to anybody who thinks that they're the king of the Jews except Caesar. The people had been saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the one. This is the Messiah. Because our concept of the Messiah is that he is going to save us from the Romans. And that was it. Okay, you want proof? Last chance, last chance for the disciples to ask the God of heaven any question. Acts chapter 1 verse 6, one of my, the most amazing texts emblazoned upon my mind because again, I do not want to be like this. You have one last chance to ask a question to God. And this is the question that they asked. When are you going to make Israel great? He's been with them for three and a half years. He he knew some of them as he was growing up, we're pretty sure. And, 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 And now he's been dead, buried, resurrected, and with them for 40 days, he's about to go up into heaven, and they have one last chance to ask him a question, and what do they ask him? They ask him a question from their framework of reference, their picture of God. That's what they ask their question from. Because the Messiah was supposed to come and was supposed to liberate them from the Romans. That's what they believed. The only reason, my friends, the only reason that they were even successful was because they obeyed the one commandment that Jesus gave them. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Comforter. That's the only reason that we have any of the rest of the New Testament. That's the only reason that the 12 were then in that place with the rest of the people and that the Holy Spirit fell on them. (laughs) I, I want you to know, this is a very, very humbling thing when you have been part of a church that has claimed so many things over the years. To realize that really the only thing that makes us of any use to God is one, to understand who he is, and two, to ask the Holy Spirit to take possession of us. Nothing else matters. Nothing. Because he is the one. He is the one who needs to be directing and helping us to have an appropriate, a proper picture of who he is. Because you see, our intentions are whack, to coin a phrase from today. Our intentions towards God are the same that his disciples had. We want him to do stuff for us that is not on his agenda. Because we just don't understand who he is. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that helps. It, it, it makes me want to go back to the drawing board. It makes me want to spend more time. I don't know, maybe it makes you feel uh, sad. But you see, the, the disciples were just as ignorant, they were just as ignorant as the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. 
because both of them wanted temporal, immediate action from their Messiah. And as far as they were concerned, Jesus failed. When Jesus died on the cross, this was not a moment of glory for the disciples. This was their most dejected moment in their entire lives. Their man, the horse in the race that they were supporting, lost when the Romans killed Jesus. Well, when Jesus was put on a Roman cross, to be more precise, and died of his own self. Remember Jesus said, I will lay down my life and I will take it up. So no, Romans didn't kill Jesus. He died himself. And he rose himself. Question today is, do we make the same mistake? Do we, do, do we, put, do we put Jesus in an Adventist box and then demand of him whatever we think he should do and, when, and, 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 and we tell him when, when to do it? Is it potentially possible that we are demanding signs just like these other guys? The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't really want to believe in Jesus because he didn't fit their box. The Jesus that Jesus was was not the Jesus that they were hoping for. I certainly hope that that is not true for you. I hope that the Jesus that you find in Scripture, this amazing God-man, is the Jesus that you want. Because it's so painful to, to read these stories and find out that there was huge amounts of disappointment on behalf of the people who thought they knew who the Messiah was supposed to be. Even though Jesus ticked all these boxes, even though he healed people and he did everything that the Messiah was supposed to do, they did not believe in him. And so as we approach Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, we, you know, what, what are our intentions what, what box ha have we put him in? What, what hoops does he have to jump through for us? When we come to him and say, you know, if you just do this, then I'll believe in you, God. It's, it's tough. What are our intentions? Do we intend to discover the real, the real Jesus? What will we do when we come face to face with the real Jesus? Will it be a happy thing? Will we accept him as our Lord and Savior? Or will we be just disappointed like the disciples? Will it be our opinion? Will it be our intention to follow him to the ends of the earth? You know, Jesus says that he will build his church he will build his church on folks who believe in the real Jesus. The one the Father tells us of. And not even the gates of hell will be able to keep that church out of the hell that people are living in right now. So I say, onward Christ followers, Let's all get into that hell this week. In Jesus' name, amen.